You may have realized that being healthy feels different than it did in the past now that you're over 50. If you want to maximize your health potential but don't have time to read through overwhelming pages of Google links, this is the show for you. Welcome to Healthy Tips After 50. We love doing the research, finding solutions, talking to health experts, and learning what works and what doesn't. Now, your host. She spent the last 25 years dedicated to feeling her best and is here to share her best findings with you, Susan Rosen. Hello, everyone. This is your host, Susan Rosen. And today, my guest is, oh, and I forgot to ask you how to pronounce your name, Dr. Ardovan Asley. That's perfect. Oh, my God. Okay. (laughs) That was great. Okay, good. (laughs) And, and he, he's here. He is a board-certified spine surgeon. And um, he received his undergraduate education at the University of California, Berkeley, which I have to put that, that little thing in because that's where I went as well. Perfect. Not at the same time, probably. But um, anyways, he's got earned his MD from um, New York Medical College and then went to St. Vincent's Hospital in New York City to do his residency. And that's as much information as I'm going to give you because I'm going to hand this over to him to tell us a little bit more about why he ended up working in the area that he's working in and um, what helps him to get up and go to work every day. Sure, absolutely. Um so just uh, thank you very much for having me here. That's a person that I need to do. I would like to thank you for giving the mm-hmm. opportunity for, to, for me to talk and relay the knowledge that I've gained in the last 20 years of being a spine, practicing spine surgeon uh, to people. Um, one thing I just wanted to add that uh, after my residency in St. Vincent's Hospital in Manhattan, then I did a year of fellowship in spine surgery in uh, Brigham and Women's and Beth Israel Hospital, part of Harvard mm-hmm. University. And that was from 2001 to 2002. And after that, I came back home. I considered Northern California home because my mother lives in Berkeley. So I settled in the Sacramento area and I've been in this area since. Um, so I'm in private practice and I'm heavily involved mm-hmm. in research and development. So why spine surgery? Uh, well, I got to tell you the backstory to that. When I finished medical school, I was dead set on becoming a, a heart surgeon. So actually, I finished medical school. I went to general surgery to become a heart surgeon. But the first year when I was in training for heart surgery, they came out with little stents, little springs that you put in the coronaries to keep it open. The uh-huh. second I saw yeah. that, I was like, uh-oh, this is not going to be good for me. <laughs> So actually, I threw myself into fire. I uh, tried to change my residency, and changing residency is absolutely difficult, but I was able yeah, to do yeah. it. I got into orthopedic surgery, and uh-huh. looking back now, it was a very important decision because now heart surgeons cannot find jobs because everything, all the oh. cardiac care is done through small incisions by cardiologists as opposed to heart surgeons cracking the chest open, basically. So after that, I got to orthopedic surgery, and I developed a very good relationship with my professors in spine surgery, and I got interested in spine. Um, So I did a fellowship in spine surgery. I started my practice, and I got very good at spine surgery. And um, I always had a um, question in my head because I, you know, finished, and I um, uh, started practicing in a small town north of uh, Sacramento called Yuba City, and I always had this thing that, uh, you know, is this uh, practicing in a small town? I, I did. I, I went to Berkeley, Harvard, that's and that, and I ended up in a small town. Is this my glory? Is this my, you know, thing? And I always told myself, you know, it doesn't matter. You're a doctor. You're taking care of patients. You're taking care of patients in a small town or a big town, celebrities or not celebrity, blue-collar workers. It's all the same. It doesn't mm-hmm. matter to me. Mm-hmm. Till, till somebody made it. Uh, one of the surgeons from uh, San Francisco made a comment to my patient. Uh, uh, and he basically turned around to my patient who had gone to see him for a second opinion as a part of workers' compensation kind of a protocol. Oh, okay. 
He told him, you either get your surgery in Sacramento or you get it done right. <gasps> and, <laughs> right. and did that, you sue changed, him? <laughs> what is that? I said, did you sue him? <laughs> you know, to be honest, I got to turn around and actually thank him. Next time I see him, uh, I would like to thank him because that changed okay. my life. Why? I started uh, my endeavor. I said, I got to show that I am somebody. And just yeah. because you practice in a small town, for every doctor that's been in a small, practicing in a small town and getting dissed by doctors who are in a big town or university uh, base, I have to do something for all of us. So mm. I started, I told myself I got to get into research and development. Well, I had to identify a problem first to see how we can solve it. Well, it turns out in the world of spine surgery, we have great, great problems with aging population. The great majority of the surgeries that we do, we call the fusion surgery. When the cushion between the two bones have gone bad or the Mm -hmm. alignment has gone bad, we have to Mm -hmm. realign the spine, take the cushion out, and fuse the bones together, the vertebrae Mm -hmm. together. Well, we do that with a device that we call pedicle screw, and I have it in my hand right now. It's a large Ah. screw that gets inserted into the bone, and I have a glass Mm -hmm. model of it. And uh-huh. if you want to immobilize different vertebrae, you put these screws in their uh, respective vertebrae. Okay. And they all, these screws have a tulip on the other end that they can accept the rod. So you put as many screws as you uh. want, as many levels that are, you're going to fuse, and then you put the rod in between them. And there's a screw that tightens the rod. And basically this immobilizes the spine for the segment that you're trying to fuse. So the okay. fusion can take place. And the fusion is basically ah. growing bone where there was no bone before. So okay. basically turn two, three, four vertebrae into one bone. That's what we want to do. Okay. okay. I knew that we had problem in the aging population. Why? Because the backbone or what we call vertebrae, is not a solid block of bone. It's not wood. It's not cement. It's like a shoebox. The outside shell is what we call cortical, very strong bone, but the inside bone is a spongy bone, very weak, especially with aging population with osteopenia, osteoporosis, the inside bone gets very weak. Once you pass 70, the inside bone becomes butter, basically. And we put these large screws into it, and there's a high, high, high rate of failure. They just cut out, basically. Wow. So I wanted to come up with a device that can solve that problem. So I started doing my research and development. Well, I came up with this device right here. Show it to you. I came up. Now, you got to understand the anatomy of vertebrae to understand where I'm coming from. As I said, the outside bone is cortical bone, and the inside bone is a weak bone. So I told myself, I said, I have to come up with a device that uses outside bone as opposed to inside bone. Okay. And and if you look at the anatomy of vertebrae, you have the vertebral body in the front, and then you have this arch, this canal uh, in the oh. back that the nerves go through. Well, okay. the roof of that canal, which we call lamina, is a solid cortical bone, this roof called lamina. Uh-huh. Lamina happens to be one of the strongest bone in the body. So I said, why don't we use that? Yeah. Because we've used it before. Before the screws, we had hooks that would hook into the lamina. So the device, the, med- the device that I came up was this device right here. It's a flat plate that sits against the lamina and mm-hmm. uses composite straps to wrap around the lamina. And mm-hmm. these straps are stronger than same size steel cables. So they're super strong. Wow. And right over the plate, there's a hole right here that the that the strap goes through, and then Mm -hmm. this strap gets tensioned like a zip tie, basically. Then -hmm. there is a built-in clamp into the base of this two loop that you turn, and the clamp clamps the strap. Therefore, this device holds on to vertebrae, basically, without penetrating the bone. Ah. I I presented this device to, um, to... American, I'm sorry, Congress of Neurological Surgeons, basically the neuro, uh-huh. neurosurgeons that are, you know, it's, it's their, it's their thing. I'm an orthopedic surgeon, but the neurosurgeons, uh, they have a, they have their own meetings. Mm-hmm. I presented to them and I won 
the Innovation Showcase in Congress of Neurological wow. Surgeons in 2015. So I just want to say that I'm legit. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so my device, even though it's uh-huh. not being used now, it did win an award from Congress uh-huh. of Neurological Surgeons. Wow. But then this what happened. This what happened. I started refining my device because it was in a, in, in a prototype stage. Then I hit a problem that I cannot disclose what the problem was. But I said, to solve this problem, let me look at the screws. Let me see if they have the same problem or how what happens in the screws then. Well, that's when the things started taking off for me. I mean, mm. what I found out was absolutely dropped my jaw to the floor. And mm-hmm. I will explain it to you. So I looked at the literature. I dug, dug deep into the literature about these screws. What I found out was that great majority of the papers, and I found six, actually seven articles that was published in late 1990s and early 2000s that said these screws do not work. They do not oh. increase fusion rate and they do oh. not improve outcome. Right. Okay. I was like, wait a minute, what's going on? And these papers were multi-center, multinational multi-author paper that were published wow. in our spine journal. So they were very legit. Some of them won awards for the quality of research. And I was like, wait a minute, what's going on? So that, that as I dug deeper, I found only one paper, one paper that said these screws work beautifully. And it was huh. published by, wait, just every time I thought things cannot get worse, it got 10 times worse. And that happened at least four or five times. Uh-huh. So wait, I'm, I'm going to tell you, this is going to blow your mind. So okay. I found only one paper was published by one guy, mm-hmm. a, a gentleman named Dr. Zedablik. He is the chairman of University of Wisconsin Spine Surgery right now as we speak. Wow. He published a paper in 1993. That said, these screws work beautifully and they increase fusion rate, they improve outcome, they are wonderful. So I said, man, let me look into this. What is going on? And first thing that I found out was jaw dropping by itself. The paper that he published in 1993 was published as a preliminary report. I spent about oh. two years to find the final report and I couldn't find it. So I eventually uh, approach one of the uh, spine surgeons, one of the famous uh, spine surgeons from one of the Midwestern universities. Uh-huh. And I asked oh, okay. him, I said, where is the final report? And he said, it uh-huh. doesn't exist. This preliminary report is the only thing that we have. I was like, what? A preliminary report? All right. Let me explain to you. Right now, as we speak, if you open the North American Spine Society and American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons website right now, they use this paper that was published in 1993 by Dr. Zedevlik, which is a preliminary report only, as a reference. I said, wait a minute, what is going on? Let me look into Dr. Zedevlik a little bit more. And what I found out, it was 10 times worse. Now, you got to understand what was going on in 1990s. When these screws came out, there were bad results. So by 1990s, 1992, there were about 7,000 lawsuits against the manufacturer of the screws, a company called Medtronic, right? Oh, yeah. No, I know them well. Yeah. Right, right. So I said, whoa, what's going on here? Then I found out, and it's a, it's a, you can Google this. This is, this is like a public knowledge. Mm-hmm. Then I Googled Dr. Zedevlik, and I found out, so he publishes this paper in 1993, by 1995 and 1996, as these lawsuits were disappearing because of his paper, he started getting paid from Medtronic. So from 1996 till 2003, he got paid $34 million. Wait, you think that's bad? No, he got 10 times worse than that. <laughs> you think it can't get worse? No, it did. And this is what happened. By 2004, like early 2000s, same company, Medtronic, put Dr. Zedeblik in charge of another important study on a product called BMP. It's a bone graft substitute. So when you do fusion, you have to lay bone so, lay, so that bone can turn into a solid bone, right? Well, we have to get that bone from somewhere. 
normally you get the bone from the patient from some other spot. Well, that mm -hmm. creates a problem in the other spot. The other spot becomes painful. So we try not to harvest patients. Well, there is this hormone, there is this product called BMP that um, this company came up with uh, and apparently negates, uh, just gets rid of the need for bone graft. So mm -hmm. it was a very important product. So Medtronic put Dr. Zedeblik in charge of that study. Well, he published the paper in 2004, Dr. Zedeblik published the paper in 2004 saying that this product works great, except, mm -hmm. except this time he got caught overstating mm -hmm. his results. By who? By United States Senate. Oops. There was an investigation and it was a, wait, it gets 10 times worse after this. You think that's bad? It gets worse again. The United States Senate concluded that the paper that he published in 2004 was not written by him, was written by the company. Oh, my God. Isn't oh that crazy? God. So yeah. so let me simplify this. You have six award-winning multinational multi-center papers that says these screws don't work at all. Yeah. And then you have one paper unfinished by a guy that got caught cheating by the United States Senate. So what is going on? Right? Okay. Well, yeah. it took me three to four years to um, to find the answer, and I found it. And this mm -hmm. is what's going on. Because for three, four years, I was just questioning what I do. I'm like, oh, my God, are we crooks? Are we part yeah. of a, a big conspiracy theory? Are we right. feeding yeah. not knowingly as surgeons? Because that's what we get trained for. Yeah. This is what they right. teach us, that the screw is the best thing you can do. That's yeah. To this day, right now, to this day, I use these screws. Why? Because everybody asks me, it's like, well, if you know this, are you still using them? Absolutely, because that's standard of care. Uh... I don't want to practice my own brand of medicine. That's the mm -hmm. worst thing I can do. Because I tell everybody, I said, if I don't put these screws in and something happens and the results are not good and the patient seeks second opinion, that's the first thing they're going to point to. It's like, oh, that's right. sure. That's, that's right. That's screw, right. And right. the lawyers will be, will be close behind. Yeah. Of course. And, and so, yeah. so I have to practice uh, you know, standard of care. So right. what I'm trying to tell you is that that's what we're trained to do. So what is going on? Why can't we? So... This is what's going on. And, and let me add you a couple of things as well. Two things. One, it's not something, what I'm saying right now, it's not something that I just kept for myself. No. Mm -hmm. uh, when I go to these meetings, uh, you know, American, North American Spine Society, American Academy of Orthopedic Surgery, mm -hmm. I get up and I mention this. And I say that. And this is the answer that I get from so-called leaders of the field over and over. I get the same answer over and over and over. And the answer is, yes, we know that we haven't been able to show with research that these screws work. But we know that they do, and we'll show it at some point down the, down the line. <gasps> this is their answer. Right. Oh, my God. I know. I know. I'm going to get back to this, okay? I'm going to get back to the statement. So, this is, so what I'm trying to tell you is that this is not something that I just kept it for myself. I fight the fight. I go to these meetings, and actually, uh, I wrote a book about this. The book's name is right. Corporate yeah. Spine. Uh, and I go step by step in terms of what has happened throughout this endeavor. What, what, how do we get here? What happened here? And this is the answer. To become a, a spine surgeon, there are two ways that you can get there. You can either go through neurosurgery, become a brain surgeon first, and then become a spine surgeon, or you can become an orthopedic surgeon then do fellowship in spine surgery and practice as a spine surgeon. So there are two ways of going. Now, the carpentry that we use in spinal surgeries, like he's using these screws, is all came from orthopedic surgery. Mm -hmm. And in the orthopedic surgery, our knowledge came from fracture fixation. Okay. You know, in late 1960s or 70s, we found out that the best way to treat a fracture was to hold them together in a rigid fashion. We developed this technique called AO, capital A, capital O, AO technique. Um, it's a German name, Unger Stero Osteosynthetica. It's a German group that came up with this technique that uh, they opened the fracture, they put 
plates and screws, a large oh. thick plate right next to the bone, uh, secure them to the, to the bone with the screws, and that holds the both ends of the fracture together so it can heal together. We call it the rigid fixation. So okay. we, we and then what do, you, what do you do? You go in and take out, take all that the screws and stuff out, or what do you do? When no, no, no. Healed? These they they stay, stay in unless in they there? become a problem. Yeah, unless they oh, become a problem. Okay, right. Okay. Right. So it's so curious. we learned that. So right. So we learned that the key mm -hmm. for bone healing together is a rigid mm -hmm. fixation. So mm -hmm. as orthopedic, and this is gets 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 like branded in, into our brain, gets just stamped into our brain. Uh, yeah. that uh, this is the key, the rigid fixation. So when we became spine surgeons, well, we said, okay, we know how to heal bones. So we, we got that concept. We applied that to spine, therefore with screws and rods, and that's what we call rigid fixation. Well, it took me two years to understand there is a problem, and this is how it goes. Concept of rigid fixation works in extremity because of one important reason, you can eliminate gravity. When you do surgery in the leg, you put the patient on crutches. If it's the upper extremity, you have in a sling. So you eliminate gravity. Okay. In spine, you can't eliminate gravity. Oh. You cannot put the patient on sling for five months at a time. No. So that, that means that that construct is in constant stress. Constant, constantly mm. getting jarred all day. The second the patient gets up, that concept mm -hmm. is under stress. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we have to, the, the concept that I'm saying is no different than building a high rise in an earthquake zone. We've mm -hmm. learned through years that when you build a high rise in an earthquake zone, you don't make it stiff, you make it flexible so it can That's swing right. That's and right. dissipate That's right. energy. And they, put it, and they put them on those rollers now too. Yeah. Exactly. So the same concept should be applied to spine surgery. So what we've done is that we applied a knowledge from general orthopedic extremely fractured and we extremely fracture fixation and we applied that knowledge to spinal fusion. We, we should have never done that. And I always tell people spine surgery was never meant to be a subspecialty of orthopedic surgery. There's nothing in orthopedic surgery that's going to help you become a better spine surgeon. Nothing. I'll tell you right now. Mm -hmm. But that's the route that we took. Uh -huh. And when the results came back from these studies, they told us this doesn't work. We didn't know anything better. We just right. blamed the studies. We said, oh, these are not good. And of course, the Dr. Zedeblik's uh, paper was a, uh, a wrench in the whole thing. And that really just you know, uh, put us in the wrong direction. It wasn't falsified. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a false, false. Nobody can duplicate. I mean, this paper is so off toward the good side that it now everybody would know that, that those results just cannot exist. Yeah. It, it's crazy. It's crazy. So that's the situation. That's what, you know what? About two months ago, I was a chaperone. Uh, yeah. for field trip for one of my daughters. Uh, she's okay. 11 years old. She's in the fifth grade. So we went to uh -huh. Marine Headlands. Oh, and yeah. over there, right. And the camp counselor was teaching and we came to the bridge and she uh -huh. was explaining how the bridge actually swings <gasps> in the air yes. and moves. Yes. Right. And she turned around to the whole fifth grade class and said, kids, remember this. Flexible is stronger. Flexible is stronger. And I'm like, oh my God, these are fifth grade students. <laughs> they actually know the concept that actually it should be flexible to be stronger. Yeah. And I cannot yeah. put this into, you know, spine surgeon's head that, you know, we were going in the wrong direction. As a matter of fact, you know what's the what's the answer that we've come up with right now? You know what's the current treatment uh -oh. of what we're doing? We're using more rods. Oh so no! Have, right. So we used we used to have two rods, one on each side. Now we're double that with two rods. We're going in the completely aye, aye. up. Oh god! When oh I'm my looking god! At this, I'm like I'm like oh my god! The whole world, the whole architecture, engineering, everything that you feel, they're telling us that you've got to have some sort of a device that actually can yeah. dissipate the yeah. energy. 
and oh, we're yeah. going in the wrong direction. Yeah. Now, now I got to say that. I got to say something about my book, though. Mm. I knew that I had to write a book to put it all together so people can understand okay. the fault. But I didn't want to write a book that is just about complaining and boring and stuff. Yeah, and pointing so fingers I, and stuff. Yeah. Correct. So I wanted to have a book that actually is constructive so people can actually uh -huh. learn as opposed to getting all upset mm. or, you know, being. Mm. You know. One thing that I truly believe us as spine surgeons haven't done is to educate the public in terms of what we can or what we cannot do. What's our point of view? Because I really think in 20 years of practice, the reputation of spine surgery has not gotten better. It's still as bad as when it was when I first started my practice, <laughs> even though everything in the world has, has, has just advanced. Every time I talk to a, about a surgery to a patient, they tell me that, you know, they have scared them off. You know, their relatives said, do not get surgery. Oh my God, don't, don't believe them. Don't do it. Nor so. So, so I really think one of the reasons for that is that us as spine surgeons haven't really educated the public in terms of what we do, what's available to us, what's not available to us, what is a good outcome, what is not a good outcome, I guess. You know, how do we choose our patients for surgery? So the first four chapters of my book, I've tried to teach people uh, with back pain in terms of what we go through, what I've learned in 20 years of practice of basically practicing spine surgery. And I've written that in a way that it's not a textbook. I've tried to mm. teach my patients through stories of my patients so they can understand uh -huh. what's going on. So yeah. it's easy to understand, you know. Um, uh -huh. But that was the goal of my book, to not only open uh, the public in terms of what's going on in spine surgery, but also teach them in terms of, you know, hey, what is spine surgery? What yeah. can we do? I mean, when you go to a spine surgeon, what is your expectation? You know, uh, do you get scared? Do you, do, do you, do you like, you know, uh, what happens? Why, right. why, why you go to 10 spine surgeons and you have 10 different recommendations? I mean, that's something that the patients need to understand why, you know? Uh -huh. um, yeah. And, and basically, this is where we are. And that's my crusade, basically, right now, to try to bring this knowledge to people so people can start mm -hmm. asking questions. Because let me tell you this. Yeah. The first thing that patients are going to tell me is that, well, didn't you bring this up with your leaders of the field? Didn't you show? I have. I have done everything. Right. And over this is the problem. And over, over and, and over, 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 over. Again. And, yeah. and this is their attitude. Their attitude is oh. that, Yes, we haven't been able to show that they work, but we know that they work and we will show it down the road at some point. And I tell them, oh my God, that's a true definition of insanity. That's a that's true right. definition of insanity to do the same experiment right. over and over and over, over and over and over again. And, yeah. And hoping and you, that one of them, you know, you know and, 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 and this is the problem that they have no answer. This is the, this is my point that they have no answer to this. I tell them, look. Right. Every time you fail to show that something works, you have just shown that it didn't work. Yeah. I mean, their attitude yeah. is that, yeah. well, if a paper comes out and says it didn't, it didn't work, uh, no harm is done. I'm like, no, failing so, to show that something, right. Failing to I show wanna, that something did not I work. Want them, is, I want right. them to get the surgery. Right. Have the right. doctors right. get the surgery first before they start telling you how, how good it works. Right, exactly. You know, these are not two separate events. Failing to show that something did not work is equal to showing that it didn't work. That, that, that's right. That it that this is, is a failure. failure. Yeah. Right. So all these papers are saying that this stuff is not working, and we keep going, oh keep God. trucking. Right. Why? Because our training is wrong. Our yeah. training tells oh, us that yeah. this is the way to go. So. You know, well, the, the question is, well, what's the answer? The answer is this. Spine surgery, unfortunately, was never meant to be a subspecialty of orthopedic surgery. Uh, almost, I tell even my colleagues, like, whatever you learned in orthopedic surgery, you have to unlearn and then relearn spine surgery. Example, <sighs> I'll give you this, this is the same exact concept. Newtonian <laughs> physics and quantum physics. If you yeah. want to build a house on Earth, you can use Newtonian physics. But if you want to build a laser or shoot an aircraft to space, you cannot use you cannot do that using Newtonian physics. You have to do that using quantum physics. Yeah. 
Same thing. Same yeah. orthopedic surgery is a simple carpentry. That simple carp carpentry is not going to work for a complex device like spine that the motion is rotational. Ah, uh, okay, okay. Simple right. as that. Yeah. Right. Is yeah. that crazy? Yeah. Well, and it, sound, and it sounds like they don't even use it for the simpler stuff. It's, from from what well, you're no, saying, they, use, they really only use it mostly for spine surgery, right? That's <laughs> right, that's right. They use it for, so every time you see somebody get a fusion, everybody who gets in, somebody yeah. gets scoliosis, they get these screws, yes. Right, right, right exactly. But so, they don't do that when, when you break your arm. Well, you know, you know, that's a whole different thing. They use different, they yeah. only use the screws for the breaking out. They use plates and screws, but the concept is the same. Okay. Rigid okay. fixation. Got that's it. the okay. concept. Hold them together okay. rigidly. Right. Well, when you put them yeah. rigidly, then of course, if you have a bone, um, that's not good quality, then mm -hmm. it's going to fail. You know, yeah. I, I walk into my, uh, a lot of my colleagues and I tell them, I tell them that my device that uses scraps are stronger than the screws. And they start laughing at me. They're like, how, what do you even say that you comparing the strap yeah. to a screw? And I'm like, it's very simple. Let's say you can build a screw as strong as it can hold this building. If you put it into junky bone, you got junk. My yeah. device maybe is not as strong as a screw, but it holds on to one of the strongest bones in the body. Yeah. So, yeah. so that's yeah. the difference yeah. that I just can't get through. Them. So, yeah. Well, what's your goal, Dr. Asley? What, what are you trying to accomplish right here? This is my accomplishment. I want at least patients ask these questions to their surgeons so the surgeons yes. can go back yes. and do the research and, and find out what the research has written because this is the problem. When we go to these conferences, I go, I've been going to conferences twice a year for 20 years. Mm -hmm. Every mm -hmm. time I go to these conferences, these professors who give lecture, they show their best films, best outcomes, best patients, best scenarios. Of course. They never show. So we go to these conferences. We get this perception that, oh, my God, everything works. Everything is great. Then we come back and do the same Wrong. surgery on our patients, and our patients are miserable, and they go to you know, pain management and, you know, they'll, they're yeah. on pain medicine yeah. for the rest of their lives. You know, I, I, one time I got up in North American Spine Society and I said, we have created an alternative matrix for ourselves that we think that yeah. we've created this thing in our head that everything works great. And meanwhile, in reality, it's not working. <laughs> right, exactly. Exactly. We're doing this to all these patients and they're worse off than than before we had the surgery. Right. And then when we try to solve the problem, we go in the wrong yeah. direction because you're using principles, wrong principles. Yeah. That's what is that. So we're so right now spine surgery is stuck in this 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 horrible um you know we're pool that is just going yeah. down. It's 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 crazy. And I'm trying to just make people understand all i say to them is this please please go back and read the re research i mean please yeah. because every time we're good is this this is what has happened sometimes sometimes in 1990 late 1990 somebody got up in these lectures and i said there's a there's a there's a tremendous amount of evidence that shows these screws work then people who were listening to the lecture they went uh, six months later, somebody else got up and said, there's a, a plenty of evidence that shows these screws work. And then uh, six months later, somebody else got So throughout the years... Playing telephone. Yeah. Right. <laughs> we've, throughout the years, we have made ourselves believe that these screws yeah. do great. Yeah. I remember I remember we were... I was um, presenting uh, to a, a professor, a young professor from Michigan. And I told him this. I said, you know, great majority of the uh, papers say that the screws don't work. He said, what are, you, what are you talking about? We showed a long time ago the screws work great. And he's calling next to him and said, we never did. We never did. <laughs> I'm like, so what I'm saying is that throughout the years, we have somehow hypnotized ourselves into believing that this works great without any real evidence. It's, it's that crazy. Wow. 
we wow. really talk about hypnotizing oh. ourselves. Yeah. Just, let me tell you this. Let me tell you one thing. You don't you don't believe me? I'll tell you one thing. Google right now. Go to Google. Put down search Zedeblik spine fusion article. Zedeblik spine fusion article. You will see that article that was published in 1993. You will see mm. that this paper has been referenced in 1,125 article as of today. 1,125. Oh so this article is a most referenced paper in the entire world of spine surgery, this article. Huh? And if you will see, you will see that it says preliminary result. How do you explain that? How do you explain a preliminary result is a most referenced paper in the entire, why? Well, there's only one explanation. There's nothing else. Yeah. And, and, there's and we're talking about human beings who right. we know like to follow each other. Right. And right, not right, go right. off and say no, you know, or hold up their hand saying, no, this doesn't, this doesn't work. This doesn't. Right. Right. I don't you understand. Know, when I wrote my book, my wife didn't want to write me a book. She pleaded with me. She begged me not to write my book. She mm-hmm. said, you have a great career. We have a great life. You're going to ruin it. I'm like, yeah, right. my life is already, yeah. you know, I told her, I told my wife, I said, my life is already ruined. You know, when you find this out like this, how am I going to go to sleep? I can't go to sleep at night. So when I found out, and then I'm not doing anything about it. So after I wrote the book, even if my book turns into something or not, or people actually listen to it or not, at least I've gotten off my chest. At least I I did my part in terms of warning people what we're doing to them. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah. That's scary. That's very, very scary. It's so much. And and let me explain to you how this got here. Okay. There's an explanation. And this is how it goes. Every time we use these instruments, we use it and there's a company that manufactures it, right? Mm-hmm. So that surgeon has some sort of a relationship with that company. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, guess what? If you get up and say, hey, I did this surgery and this thing fell apart, the first thing they're going to ask is, what company was it? Well, that's irrelevant because these products are all very similar. These screws are very similar. So the companies don't want you to present those bad results. So slowly throughout the years, the culture has been not to present bad surgeries, bad outcomes. Right. And that's just mm-hmm. wrong. That's what the companies have done to us and not to us, to you, to people. Mm-hmm. So oh, yeah. the first thing that needs to happen is that that heavy control, and I'm talking about companies have surgeons in their pockets. Simple as that. Oh, yeah. And that needs to stop. Without the heavy influence of companies, we're not going to be able to save spine surgery. The first thing that needs to happen is to cut off those relationships because they've taken us, you know, we always, I always say, you know, we need the companies. We need to develop, you know, new techniques and all that stuff. But so far it has turned into disaster. So far we've yeah. ended up yeah. basically using junk. And with these junk, Patient doesn't get the benefit of anything, uh, but the company it's worse. is billions. We're talking about billions of billions of billions of dollars making profit hand over fist, and patients are not getting anything, and our healthcare is sinking. It's just, it's, 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 yes, yes, and and I have no doubt that this is not unique to the whole area. That is one of my. That's right. And that is one of my things that I need to say. Because when a CEO becomes a CEO of a healthcare company, he has oh, one God. goal and one goal in his mind only to make as much money as he can, no matter right. what. Because he knows right. that his time as a CEO is limited. So he yeah. will push, he will bend the rules, he will do whatever he can. Oh, yeah. Yeah. To bring a product into the market without checks and balances, because those checks and balances are going to take time. So 10 years later, and of course, they're going to find a doctor that's going to write favorable 
uh, uh, favorable research. Well, 10 years uh-huh. later, when we find out that product didn't work, nobody says anything. They just move on to the next product. And I'm like, yeah. oh, wait a minute, come back here. What is this thing you wrote yeah. here? What about all these people that have it in their bones? And, and, and what, I, what I tell people is that the victims are not just the people who receive that product. No, the victims are far more uh, diverse because when you do this product, then the whole, when you publish these wrong papers, the whole, uh, the whole uh, field moves in the wrong direction. Uh, yeah, and the yeah. thinking becomes wrong because you think like, oh, well, wait a minute, this stuff worked. Meanwhile, it didn't work. But you have research that it works. So maybe we should try something else that's similar to that that worked. Like, wait, it didn't yeah, work. Yeah, going that, don't yeah. go in that direction. <laughs> that was a fact. Or they just stop. Or they just stop looking for anything because it's already been fixed, right? Right, right. They already right. have a Meanwhile, solution. So they're going to go over here and work on something else. Correct. Correct. So, 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 you know, a, a correction. Now, I'm not saying by any means that. We got to look at the product so deeply that delays it bringing. No, I think a product should come to the market fast, but then immediately after we got to sit down and see if it really working or not. Uh, mm-hmm. so you won't go 10 years, 20 years without, you know, doing anything about it, you know, right. uh, right. that's right. the best way. But at this point, because see, let me tell you this, there, there's a big perception, uh, misconception. That it took me a long time to understand. Our perception is that if it's something is FDA approved, that means it works great. Oh, FDA approved. Oh, yeah. Must you know, be perfect. Right? Must be perfect. Yeah. No. Well, what I realized is that FDA doesn't have a power to actually test every single product. It takes universities. It takes, you know, hundreds of thousands yeah. of people to do research. So, but what the FDA can do is to say it doesn't cause harm. That's really the only thing that the FDA uh, can do, not cause yeah. harm. Then it's left for right. universities, Harvard, Johns Hopkins, to try to run uh, studies to see if this works or doesn't work. Because mm-hmm. this is the problem. FDA relies on the company to show evidence. Well, the that's company right. is going to go find a doctor that's going to write a <laughs> paper. <laughs> I mean, because, because this is the unfortunate, you know, I, I'm throwing my 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 people under the bus, but it's the truth. I mean, somebody has to be honest about these things. Uh, if they go to 10 guys, uh, all 10 of them say, you know what, we're not going to work with you because we don't think this works. They're going to find that 11th guy that's going to say, yeah, okay, we'll twist the numbers a little bit. You know? <laughs> so well, that's an unfortunate problem. Uh, you know, so so the, the, the company never says that, oh, uh, we showed it to 10 guys and they didn't want it to, but this guy said, okay, and we have just the paper that we have. Right. <laughs> they, yeah. They don't, they don't, they don't, they don't see that part. You know? So, um, so yeah. So my <sighs> okay. goal of this to make people aware of mm-hmm. what is really happening in our healthcare yeah. and, and right. we got to be just more diligent because, yeah. you know, this is what we're going to end up end up like 30 years, 30 years of really no improvement and doing the wrong thing. Yeah, if anything, going in the wrong direction. Correct. Correct. Yeah, yeah. (sighs) Okay. Well, with all of that being said, I should, we should probably wrap up here so you can get back to work. And um, Well, I just want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to express this because this needs to be looked into this just cannot go on like this i mean just the fact that they say you know oh eventually we'll find that one paper that shows this work that doesn't that doesn't that that's not right it's burden the burden of proof is on us us surgeons we are planting these screws it's our job to show that it works right yeah and we're not doing that no 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 well you know it's just one more example of corporations right. creating their own their own culture right culture world world view whatever you yeah. want to call right. it in a worse expecting... way right. oh totally absolutely right. absolutely i mean really an unfinished paper you get paid and then you know, you find out nobody can duplicate your that's what the nobody can duplicate your have... work. Yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. 
Okay. Thank you Bye, for Dave. having me. <laughs> <laughs> my pleasure. My pleasure. I'm glad that I don't have, knock on wood, I don't have any of that coming up. <laughs> if I do, I'm going to reach out to you if I have any of Thank those you. kind of issues. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to do the same thing because that's the standard of care. I'm sorry. <laughs> You know, it's, even if I even if I say that, you know, even if I sign off and say no, no, this is this is I agree. And anyways, we don't need let, let's let's wrap this up and then we can talk right, about that. Right. Okay, okay. Thank so um, let me say <laughs> this always seems so funny to do with some of the people that I'm talking to, like you, to say that none of this is to be seen as medical advice. And even though you are a doctor, we're I'm not and you're not here trying to look at anybody's in particular because you can't look and see what they've actually got. Um, and with all of that, I will say to everybody that I will see everyone next week. This has been Healthy Tips After 50 with Susan Rosen. To stay on the cutting edge of the most effective health strategies, subscribe to this podcast and let us know what you thought of the show with a comment or like on iTunes. Visit HealthyTipsAfter50.com for this episode's show notes, more resources, and free offers.